You need to sit down right now. You're out of line. In fact, you're excused. You need to go sit in the back with your, with your uh, chief public defender. Mr. Weeks, please ask the lawyer from your office to go sit down and not say anything else. To try to threaten my children and bring up my children is inappropriate. Go to the back of the room now. She's the judge who made headlines during the trial of the Parkland School shooter. Now that she's left the bench for private practice, we have a chance to sit down with Elizabeth Schur and talk about this huge case and its controversies. Welcome to Sidebar, presented by Law & Crime. I'm Jesse Weber. Back on February 14th, 2018, a shooter opened fire on students and teachers inside of his former school, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. He killed 17 people, he injured 17 others, and he was eventually arrested and a grand jury indicted him on 34 charges. Broward County Judge Elizabeth Schur was randomly assigned to this historic case, but on October 20th, 2021, the defendant pleaded guilty to all of the charges, murder, attempted murder, and because of the plea, the trial jumped directly to the penalty phase where a jury would decide if the shooter would get life in prison or the death penalty. What would be the punishment? And that phase started on July 18th, 2022. During the trial, everyone in court and everyone watching live at home heard and saw this evidence against the shooter that included Google searches, drawings, testimony. Speaking of that testimony, this was incredibly emotional, hearing the disturbing accounts from those who were inside the school that very day. A student made sure the door was shut. We shut the lights off. My students went into corners. I had some with me behind my desk. Do you know how many shots were fired into your womb? No, a lot. Then I just remember feeling a sensation on the back of my head, like a, a hot sensation. And uh, I just realized I was in danger. So I reacted as quick as possible and tried to just get somewhere in cover. Now, the shooter's defense team, they presented evidence of mental health issues and a troubled childhood as reasons, as mitigating reasons that he shouldn't get the death penalty. But as the death penalty phase wore on, so did everyone's patience. Don't talk to each other back and forth. It's unprofessional. This is not happening. Okay, I apologize. Mr. Japoni, if you were talking, that goes to you too. Do not talk directly to the state. State, do not engage. This is getting out of hand. It got out of hand yesterday and it's not happening again today. If you all wanna speak, you speak through the court. Everyone knows that. That goes to both sides. Well, after weeks of back and forth, the jury eventually got the case. Now, at the time, Florida law required that a decision in favor of the death penalty had to be unanimous among the jury members. The law has since changed, but at the time, it needed to be unanimous, and the jury was not unanimous. No, the jury foreman later saying that it was a vote of nine to three in favor of death, and therefore, they recommended life in prison without the possibility of parole. Many of the families of victims were understandably outraged at the jury's decision, but that wasn't the only controversy. No, in June of 2023, a state board criticized Judge Scherer for some of her behavior during trial. The Judicial Qualifications Commission is an independent state agency made up of judges, lawyers, and citizens, and a report from its 15 members found that Judge Scherer engaged in judicial misconduct. The commission said that Scherer unduly chastised lead public defender Melissa McNeil and her defense team. The report said, quote, in limited instances during this unique and lengthy case, Judge Scherer allowed her emotions to overcome her judgment. Here's an example during victim impact statements when the defense team expressed their frustration over personal attacks by the victim's parents. When these people are upset about specific things that have gone on from that table, like shooting the middle finger up, at this court and laughing and joking, Ms. McNeil, be quiet. When these people have sat in this courtroom and watched this behavior from that table and they want to say that they're not happy about it, what is the problem? Judge, I have no problem because I have thick skin. 
But once you bring in my children, I think that's highly improper. I didn't even know you have children. I don't know what you're talking about. Your children? What about your children? For them to comment on my children is highly improper. And for this court to allow that kind of testimony is also improper. There was, I don't remember any comments about any children. And if there was, it obviously didn't, it came and went without me noticing it. Judge, I can assure you that if they were talking about your children, you would have definitely noticed it. You need to sit down right now. You're out of line. In fact, you're excused. You need to go sit in the back with your chief public defender. He's the public defender. Mr. Weeks, please ask the lawyer from your office to go sit down and not say anything else. To try to threaten my children and bring up my children is inappropriate. Go to the back of the room now. That just violated about every rule of professional responsibility that I have ever, I have never. If you're going to get up here and you're going to... Judge, I asked you to go sidebar on this matter. You sidebar or not, you don't have one of your assistant public defenders say something about my children? Judge, that same venom that the court is expressing is the same venom that defense counsel had to sit through this entire morning when their children were being referenced. She brought up her children multiple referenced. times during the trial. Nobody knows if I'm barren or not. They don't Judge, know about my children. Judge. Sit down. Sit down. Judge. Sit down, Mr. Weeks. Please do not summarily dismiss me. I'm summarily dismissing I'm asking you. Go the court. sit down. I'm asking the court. I asked the court to go sidebar. Go sit down. You don't threaten the Judge, court's children. Your everyone in this courtroom. Just did that. Go sit down. No, no one in this courtroom had to endure what we go had to endure. Go sit down. Now, by the time the commission released its report, Judge Scherer had already announced that she would step down from the bench at the end of June. Scherer is now working at a Fort Lauderdale law firm that her father started almost 50 years ago. It's called Conrad and Scherer Law Firm. It can be found at ConradScherer.com. And retired Judge Elizabeth Scherer joins us now. Judge, thank you so much for coming on here on Sidebar. It's a pleasure to get a chance to meet with you and talk about this case. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Now, to be very clear, let's be honest. I know you're coming back from a cold. Uh, so is everybody. Yes. Everybody's not feeling great. Just want to let everybody know if you, you know, voice is a little off. That's completely fine. I've, I've been you. there very, relatively recently, too. So but thanks for coming on, especially when you're not feeling well. Um, so I want to talk to you for a while. Um, this case, uh, when you were selected to oversee this case, what were you feeling? Because you knew how high profile and how big it was going to be. You know what? Um, I felt ready. I, I knew that I was the judge for this case. I had a lot of experience. A lot of people don't know this, but I was a prosecutor for over 10 years, 11 years, and I tried a lot of cases. And so I felt like, um, here we go. I can do this. Yeah, and and you played it so cool and calm and collected when you had it. I was I always think that like whenever we're covering like the Alec Murdoch trial, we're covering the Johnny Depp trial. I think about the judge a lot, and I'm like, think about right. all the attention that's on these people who are going to be presiding over this monumental case. Um, and when it was handed over to you, was there any kind of prep that you did? I mean, you talked about your career as a uh, as a you know career criminal prosecutor. Obviously, right. it's a great experience. But did you do any kind of prep um, for this case? Well, sure. So. Florida, I think, is one of the few states remaining that has the death penalty or that it doesn't have some type of moratorium on the death penalty. But as you can imagine, even though I had tried capital cases, I had not tried a and I had not presided over a death penalty case because there are few, they're few and far between. So I um, met with some of my colleagues that have uh, had actually tried uh, death penalty cases that were assigned to the civil divisions. Uh, at the time, but had previously tried death penalty cases and, um, you know, read every case I could get my hands on. I have binders and binders, hundreds of cases. I read everything um, that I could find to, get, to and prepare. How is that? How is that different presiding over that kind of case than another one? So in 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 reality, it's, it's the same as trying any other case. You, you know, the evidence, the rules of evidence, um, the procedure is the same. The difference is it's more highly scrutinized, so you have to be really on your A game, bring your A game when it comes to knowing the law and being quick to be able to, um, you know, answer legal questions that come up or issues between the attorneys, uh, you know, because you can't say, well, I need a minute. Although 
of, of course you can say that. And I did say that um, from time to time, you know, I'm going to, I think my words were, I'm going to take this under advisement, my favorite famous words so that I could think about it and put something, uh, a thoughtful um, um, ruling in writing and make sure that it, it would um, be very clear as to what my findings were. But uh, the, the biggest difference is just knowing that that those cases are more highly scrutinized on appeal in, in the event that the uh, defendant is sentenced to death, which, of uh, course, in my case, he was not. And, and I'm not going to lie to you. I've covered a number of different cases, um, death penalty cases, all different kinds of murders. This case for me watching it was not only a very long trial or phase, but it was one of the most emotionally gripping cases it, it was hard it, for me there was times i got emotional um listening yeah. to this and it was really really tough and i think it was tough for our viewers that being a part of this day in and day out what impact did that have on you um it's draining because you know the judge is the only person in the courtroom that can't cry in fact i don't think there was a dry eye in the courtroom deputies even the even the big you know strong manly tough deputies that were that were covering the, the case for me and many times i would look up and see tears rolling down their cheeks and uh and you know the, those guys are, are are pretty tough they're made of teflon most of them but um but there wasn't a dry eye in there and of course the judge has to maintain composure because i think if the judge let's let's it let's lose then then it's going to be not good for anyone so it was hard i had to I had to to listen, but keep uh, some distance between myself and and the words that were actually coming out of the witnesses' mouths and the pictures. You sort of have to put up a um, like a plexiglass, if you will, and listen and hear and understand, but keep that barrier, somewhat of a barrier, so that you you don't lose it. Was there one day or one piece of evidence that really stood out to you and you that that maybe stays with you to this day that you think about? There were two things that I actually had to take a recess because I was I was uh, unable to. I felt that I was going to be unable to to keep my composure. Uh, there was a day during the victim impact statements. Um, when Luke Hoyer's parents were talking and they just, it, it was all heartbreaking, but when they got up, it, 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 it broke my heart. I couldn't, and, 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 and I have to tell you, it was like that for everyone in the courtroom. There was something about Tom Hoyer's testimony that was absolutely heartbreaking. It, it, it was like, you could hear your, your, your own words coming out of his mouth. If, if that makes sense. Um, that day was, was really really hard and the other day was when they played uh the the test i'm sorry the the um the audio mm. that a child had had taken a cell phone audio and you could hear the kids screaming and the gunfire and you could you could just uh put yourself right there and and, and imagine what it would be like to hear that kind of terror and uh, that that was that gave me goosebumps. It was it was gut wrenching. Hey, I just want to take a quick sidebar from sidebar to really thank our sponsor of this video, Aura. Now, this may shock you. I know I didn't know this, but your personal information can be collected by data brokers and sold, and that is completely legal in the United States. Yeah, I'm talking about your full name, your email, your home address, what type of car you drive, your relatives. It's all out there. I'm going to give you an example. Look at what happens when I type in Jesse Weber. Yeah, that is a lot of stuff, and I have absolutely no idea who's using it and how. But that is where Aura comes in. You see, Aura shows you which data brokers are selling information and automatically submits opt-out requests for you. Cleaning this information up not only helps reduce the amount of spam that someone gets, but it protects from hackers who could use this information to help them access social media accounts, bank accounts, other sensitive information. Aura also does so much more to protect you and your family from online threats that you just can't see. And it's really easy to set up. You don't have to download several different apps to get things like parental controls, antivirus, VPN, password management, identity theft insurance, and more. I value my privacy. I value yours. So you can go to Aura.com slash law and crime to start your two-week free trial that is also linked below in the description. 
I, you know, one of the things that I stood out to me, and it wasn't even something that we saw, was the fact that the jury went on that site visit and they went to the school. Um, and I can only imagine what that was like uh, to experience that. A- any kind of view you can give us on what that experience was like for those jurors? I mean, it's it's just to let everybody know they visited the actual school that was sealed off on that day. So, right. you know, all the book bags were there, all the blood states were there, all the, the Valentine's Day cards were there. It was literally frozen in time. Um, yes. What did you make of that? You know what? The jurors were very uh, professional and diligent. They, they, you know, were observing everything that, that they could take in. You could tell they were, they were concentrating. They were, really trying to just take it all in and and pay attention to the details and um there wasn't there wasn't a lot of there was no emotional outbreaks or anything like that it was just very very professional and very um dutiful if you will they 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 did their job as far as looking at everything and taking everything very seriously and of course I'm not sure if you know this, but they're not allowed to ask questions or interact right. with the court or the lawyers uh, during the walkthrough. So, so we just all sort of stood by and observed them. But, but it was very, it was very serious and um, and strategic. We walked floor by floor, and they just observed everything very quietly. Some of them took notes. Some of them didn't. And what did you think of it? It was hard. The hardest part was that it was frozen in time. You could see that nothing had been changed. The The classrooms were still, in other words, if, if a student knocked over a desk, the desk was still knocked over in, exa- in its exact place. The, um, you know, the, the whiteboards with the writing on the walls and the Valentine's Day celebratory messages and, and things of that nature were still up. It was like, it was, it was like going back in time uh to to the day and 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 then being able to picture what what happened yeah i i go back and i think about that evidence a lot um and and look one of the other things that i think i look upon a lot and i know our viewers focus on upon a lot was the shooter and, and the shooter's demeanor in that courtroom what did you make of the way he was behaving in your courtroom he did everything his lawyers told him to he was very diligent in listening to their advice so whatever you observed was at the not that I I didn't hear, but I can only assume was at the advice of his attorneys. Uh, he sat quietly and and listened to them very intently. There was clearly a lot of tension between you and uh, the defense counsel. What, what what was that about when you think when you look back on it? I think that the the uh, defense attorneys were in over their head. They were inexperienced, and so they. There was only one of them out of, I don't know, five or six that was qualified uh, to try a death penalty case, um, which is very unusual. That particular office in the past has had at least five to 10 attorneys, uh, but under their current leadership, they had many attorneys quit. And so they only had one remaining that was actually even allowed by the Florida Supreme Court to try a death penalty case. And I think she was overwhelmed and again, not experienced in this type of thing so they just pulled every type of antic that they possibly could think of um and ultimately i'm sure in their opinion it it worked because the defendant was not sentenced to the death penalty and and i want to talk about that but before we do were you at all concerned about how this interaction you had with the defense would be perceived did you get any comments from people afterwards because it was being uh live streamed I mean, when I really had to, there were times when I felt for the, to preserve the integrity of the trial and of the court, I had to get on them and say, enough, cut it out. You know, when, when lawyers act like children, the judge has to act like a parent and tell them, cut it out. Because it wasn't fair to the people um, that were involved and, and the victim's family members that were sitting there watching them day after day. I mean, one of the attorneys was literally brushing her hair during the middle of in the middle of the trial. Um, they were on their phones, they were giggling, they were, you know, talking, they were, they were using their printer. When the whenever the state was questioning their witnesses, they were, they were almost like, um, have you ever seen that 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 whack-a-mole game at a at a at a a carnival? 
it was like I, every time I looked over there, and normally as a judge, I look over and I give a look, and that's it. The lawyers see it and they go, uh oh, we need to cut it out. Well, a look didn't work with them. I had to give them a look and then another look and then tell them, be quiet, stop doing that. You know, and I finally had to say, okay, listen, this is what we're going to do. The things that normally you would assume that that lawyers know and that lawyers will will uh, abide by the rules of professional responsibility, I had to lay it out. There's no talking. There's no laughing. There's no passing notes unless you absolutely have to because they would do it in such a way that it was extremely distracting to the rest of the court. And again, the victim's family members were maybe 20 feet away, 25 feet away watching all of this. They, they had a better view than I did. And at times it was it was embarrassing um, because it wasn't fair. It wasn't their day in court. It was the victim's day in court and the defendant's day in court, but they were making it um, about them. And I and I felt that 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 needed to be stopped. I appreciate you saying that because and adding context to that, because a lot of people might not have understood why it blew up the way that it did. And, and to add kind of what we maybe didn't see or hear, I, I appreciate you said that um, because you look back on one of the most tense days was was that the blow up regarding the victim impact statements and what the defense counsel said. Do you, do you look back on that and say you, you regret any part of how that was handled or you wish you said something differently or do you stand by this? You were totally justified. And, and your response to the defense counsel. Looking back and go, and looking over the transcript, yes, I, I, I do see there were times where the victims um, should have been stopped by me and, and sort of redirected. Um, there was one particular victim who had a strong accent and she was using the word um, defender where she meant defendant. Mm. And so when you read the transcript, you go, oh, that's why everybody thought she was saying defendant, excuse me, d defender, meaning public defender, but she was talking about the defendant. Those types of things don't connect until you go back and you either listen to it very carefully, you know, very slowly, um, and or read the transcript. So things that I was perceiving, in other words, I knew the context she was saying defendant, excuse me, defender, meaning defendant, where everyone else thought he was, she was talking about the public defender or defender of the, the shooter. Um, so yes, there were times where I should have redirected um, the victims, you know, in hindsight, but um, at the time it was very emotional and I was trying to let them have their day in court. And I want you to take the time to, to clear up any misconception that people might have regarding your decision to leave the bench and, and how this unfolded? Because I, I understand that there might be a misunderstanding about this. Yes, so um, so I told the chief judge, first of all, I was appointed when I was 35 or 36. I never intended for this to be a lifetime appointment. It's not, it's not like on the federal bench where it is a lifetime appointment. You run every six years. And I had served two, two or I think I was in, into my third, Second term, wait a minute, second or third term, because the first term, you don't you don't wait six years. You run when that position is open. In other words, whenever that seat was going to be open, when you take it, you have to stand for the first election. So my first term was only like 18 months. So I believe I was in, in the middle of my third term. And I had told the chief judge, Jack Tudor, uh, who, by the way, was very supportive and wonderful and throughout this whole process. And I had told him, uh, Judge, I will serve until this trial is finished, until it's completed, but, and I won't leave early because I know, I knew that the continuity was very important, but I told him when the trial is over, either, you know, immediately or very shortly thereafter, I'm going to retire and I'm going to uh, move on and do something else. So that plan was in place for years, um, nothing specific. Then I put in my notice uh, with the chief judge and the governor uh, pretty much at the exact same time that I was served with the paperwork saying that there was a, um, a professional complaint, uh, a conduct complaint filed against me uh, regarding the Cruz trial. So it, the two events were separate and, and not related to one another. I was not required to resign. Um, in fact, even in the findings of the Judicial Qualification Commission, they wrote that my resignation had nothing to do with the um, proceeding or the complaint that was filed or pending. 
So in other words, your plan was always to step down of, uh, uh, off the bench, regardless of what yes. had happened in that courtroom. Yes, yes. And, and Although yeah. they probably made it a little bit easier to uh, take the next step by the way that that trial unfolded. I mean, it certainly didn't leave a good taste in my mouth about the judicial um, system, but you know, like those, that situation was very unique and like I said, does not, that, that's not, I don't want anyone to think that that's typical behavior of how lawyers act in my circuit, because it isn't. It's, it's something that most people have absolutely never seen before. And the judges, the judiciary was horrified by, as a whole, by the way that, that, that those lawyers, particular lawyers behaved. Talking about what happened sure. in that courtroom though. Um, so we know that Nicholas Cruz, the jury recommended um, the, for the shooter, they recommended uh, life in prison. Um, I imagine right. though, no matter what, they came back with it wouldn't have been easy for you to no. to come forward with a sentence if you could talk about what it was like for you to sentence somebody um to life in prison um in this kind of case what was that like for you well the verdict form first of all there was 17 victims and so the verdict forms were four or five pages single space pages for each individual victim and so as a judge, the first thing you do is you have to look through the verdict forms. And that took me a while because, of course, the jury could find life on one particular victim, may, perhaps finding that it, the state didn't meet its burden of heinous, atrocious, and cruel. And, for example, the very last victim, uh, number 17, was was uh, a young man named Peter Wang. And he was, he was um, Let's just say, out of all the victims, he he probably would got the worst or or close to the the, the most the most physical damage. I, I don't know how to put it. I don't I don't want to. Um, no, I yeah, I understand. I understand. It just it was so. As I'm going through these verdict forms, even you know you go one and then two and then three, and I know that number seventeen is Peter Wang. So I really didn't know that the verdict was life across the board until i got to the 17th one and i saw that they had found uh life for number seven one through 17. just just so reading that there, verdict, uh, I, I, I wasn't surprised as soon as i saw the first um victim that they found life in prison i assumed it was going to be that for I, I didn't that's so interesting that you thought there was a possibility that they would come back yeah. uh for, for the death penalty with respect to one victim i thought whatever decision they have for one it would be for all of them well, uh, in my experience, even though I've not tried a death penalty case, okay, I tried a lot of cases that had 10, 20 life penalties. So they have those interrogatory verdict forms where if you find A, you go to B. If you find B, you go to C. And there are pages and pages and pages. And I've had many, dozens, as a lawyer and a, and a judge, where one victim they find not guilty and then the next victim they find guilty as charged yes did he discharge a firearm yes did he inflict um great bodily harm and 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 then you go to the next one and guilty as charged however no there wasn't great bodily harm so i've had um verdicts for sure especially if the if the jurors are very diligent and very you know methodical in going through each count there's definitely uh, cases where a jury finds that the state met its burden as to one victim, but not as to another. Uh, maybe I was naive in this case to think that, but um, you know, I hoped that they did their job and that they looked at each each victim separately. Were, were you surprised? Yes, I was. I was very surprised. Um, to me, the the state met its burden, and then and then some. I mean. It's whether the aggravators outweigh the mitigators and the aggravating circumstances, I mean, planning and methodically carrying out this gruesome killing and then and then writing a manifesto in the jail about to the next school shooter and what that person should do and how much it would cost and the supplies that they needed. I mean, there was so much premeditation and 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 the, the details were just just horrific. Horrific. Do, 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 you, do you happen to know any idea why they came back with that decision? I, I don't know. I mean, it, it's not, and again, it's, I'm not finding fault with the jury's verdict because it was their verdict. They were sworn, uh, they took an oath and that was their, their decision to make. Um, you know, and, and ultimately, even if the juror in, in Florida, even if 
they find that this that the prosecution has met its burden of proof and that the aggravators outweigh the mitigators the jury can still find however we want to rule, we want to find in favor of life right and that's okay they're allowed to do that so and we tell them that and that's part of the instruction so in this case they decided that uh they wanted to spare his life and when you sentenced him going back to that what was that like and and i think what i've also always wanted to ask you is if the jury had come back with the death penalty would you what would that have been like for you to officially sentence somebody to death i mean were you mentally prepared to do that i mean you sentenced him to well, life in prison so if you could walk us through that too sure i mean um as a judge, you have to follow the law. So even if you don't like it, and I'm not saying I don't like the law, I like it or I don't like it, it doesn't really matter because you have to follow the law. And in this case, I do feel that the state, the prosecution had met its burden and that the aggravators outweighed the mitigators. So if the jury had found in favor of death, um, then I would have had to conduct um, a hearing and review all, re-review all of the testimony and evidence and make sure that the decision was legally sound. And then I would have, so it would have been, um, it would have been weeks where I would have had to go through all of the, the testimony and evidence and do a very detailed written order. Um, but you know, that, that was part of the job. And, you know, I, I was, as much as you can be prepared for it, I, I was, I, it wouldn't have been easy because sentencing another human being uh, to a punishment of, you know, even five years in prison is not, is not an easy task. But when it is necessary to protect the public, it's something that as a judge, you just have to, you know, you have to do it and then you have to understand it's for the good of the people and you have to move on. But it, it, it's not easy. It was the, also the end of a chapter in what is a very traumatic and emotionally taxing uh, case and, and now the victim's family members um they're trying to move on with their lives H have you yeah. still remained in contact with them the people who spoke out in court um are you in touch with them at all i am i i recently was invited by the um it's a non-profit organization um i think it's called i can't remember what it's called off the top of my head um shoot Sorry, I, I just can't remember, but it's a nonprofit organization that helps anybody in the community that has been affected by the shooting. So they provide, um, they have a, a, a really nice facility where you can go and sit down. You know, they have all of the, the these beautiful paintings on the walls. Um, you can stop by, you can visit. I believe they provide um, counseling and those types of services. It's located uh, right on University, um, right on the border of Coral Springs and Parkland. So this nonprofit invited me to have dinner with the, the victim's family members back in, in, in November. And it was, it was, absolutely an honor it was it was it was really great that's great that's great and how are the family members doing i mean how, how are these families and loved ones doing you know they're all making sure that their children did not die in vain is what i can say they are making the most of a of such a terrible situation it's 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 it's, ty it's the type of thing where I, I don't know if i could i could do it um yep. You know they have so they have every reason in the world to just be mad to be mad at the world i mean it, it, because why i mean it, it, i think about it all the time why why did this have to, why why does this happen i mean it's just it's it's unspeakable and the and the fact is why i believe that most people in this world are good and most people are kind but there are a few that are just oh, evil but but these family members have have developed um non nonprofit organizations they have um one of them sends underprivileged children to pays for them to go to summer camp they have walks they have they have um all kinds of fundraising beach cleanup and all kinds of things to honor their particular children in fact starting on january 28th today is dedicated to Alyssa al hadef and what they ask people to do is participate in outdoor activities. Mm. January 29th is Scott Beagle. He was a coach, run, jog, or walk. 
And then it goes all the way through to February 14th, where they ask people to spend the day with your loved ones so that you can appreciate what you have, which is, it's beautiful. And each day is, is, is for each victim in it. And it talks about something that that particular victim like to do with their life. And they want people to really, you know, celebrate and remember their, their very young lives, which That's is beautiful. beautiful. That is beautiful. Is. That's amazing. That's an amazing thing to do. Um, Judge, uh, listen, I, I don't want to take too much of your time up. I, I wanted to ask you one sure. more question. My understanding is you have a book coming out as well. <laughs> and if you could talk to us about what the book is about and what we can expect, because again, I think it's important uh, for people who've been following this case and been following you and following your career to understand a little bit more uh, about what was going on. So we're in the very beginning stages, but it's going to be, um, and when I say beginning, I'm talking just, you know, an outline at this point. I do have uh, a publisher that has taken me on or that's very interested and that is going to be helping me with this uh, through this process. But it's going to be uh, all of the ins and outs and a lot of the details that were not disclosed during the trial, um, it's going to go through uh, back my, through my life, um, how I became sort of developed into a judge, what I did before, my role as a prosecutor, um, my family, because I have all, everybody in my family is a lawyer, including both of my, my older brother, my younger brother, and my dad, and my sister-in-law. And I have also cousins, like way too many lawyers in one family, but it'll be a lot about that and a lot about um, sort of the drive and, and the things that motivated me to become um, the ju a judge and, and, and then what I'm doing now. It doesn't sound that exciting when I'm saying it like that. No, no, I, I think we all look forward to reading it because, again, this is, I guess you could even say uh, what you're saying now is kind of a preview and a teaser to what you're going to be talking about more in depth. Yes, but when the book sure. comes out, um, I'd ask sure. you for I'd ask you if you have a title, but uh, you know I won't put you on the spot. No, all right, I don't think so. Um, listen, uh, retired Judge Elizabeth Sharer, really thank you so much for coming on. Um, really enjoyed our conversation, and wish you the best of luck. Thank you so much. It was very nice to to be on your show, and it was nice to meet you. All right, everybody, that is all we have for you right now here on Sidebar. Thank you so much for joining us once again. Please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Jesse Weber. Speak to you next time.